first of all, thank you for having me. Um, my talk today is about the event loop and it's called Everything I Thought I Knew About the Event Loop Was Wrong. And I also tried to dub my slides a little bit, so um, that's, and also with animations, mal. Uh, I used Google Translate for that, so let me know via Twitter if it does not it, if it, it sounds like some Japanese manual or something, I have no idea what I was actually typing here. So who is this guy? Um, I'm Daniel Kahn. Uh, I'm developer since 1999. This means I'm reaching the point where people are starting to be in the audience that were born when I started in the industry. Uh, I'm doing Node.js since 2012. Um, I'm a member of the Node.js uh, Diagnostics Working Group, though I should do much more there. Um, I'm technically product manager uh, and Node.js guy at Dynatrace. Um, we are a performance monitoring company, around 2,000 people, and I'm also, yeah, everything that has something to do with Node.js kind of goes through my inbox there. Uh, I'm lecturer for Node.js at the local university, which I find like, is it really translated with professor? Because I'm not professor, that's just, yeah, I'm just a lecturer there. Uh, and I'm, of course, author for Lunda and LinkedIn. I'm from Austria, as already said. Um, this this little spot here in the middle of Europe. Um, we're around nine million people. We are mostly known for Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Red Bull, and Californian governors. <laughs> means when I say, hasta la vista, baby, it sounds a little bit like him, hopefully. <laughs> this is how we look like on a Sunday. <laughs> no, really, it's a beautiful country. If you happen to come to Europe, don't skip it on your way, for, I don't know, from Prague to Italy or so. Visit us, it's really worth to spend a little bit of time there. It's small, so you, you're done pretty quickly. Uh, what will we talk about here today? Um, we will cover my, or some common misconception I had um, about the Node.js event loop. We will then hopefully learn how the event loop really works, and then we will also cover a few metrics that we can collect um, of the event loop to know how healthy it is. Why am I even doing this topic? So, as I said, we are the performance monitoring company and customers suddenly started to come to us and tell, yeah, but do you also have Node.js event loop metrics? Because, of course, performance monitoring, we, we collect a lot of metrics like memory, CPU, etc. Yeah, suddenly everyone wanted to know about event loop metrics and I thought this has to be something really obvious, everyone knows how the event loop works, I know it as well. So what I then did, it was just I created a Jira ticket and like, let's do uh, event loop metrics. Yeah, and then the story began and I figured out that I don't really know what I actually wanted and also I figured out that most probably our customers didn't know what they actually were asking for. And this is kind of the story of the, uh, yeah, uh, of the journey here. What do we know about Node.js and the event loop? We know that Node.js is evented. It's evented like everything uh, that, that is JavaScript. This means when you in the browser, click on a button and have some on-click event. That's basically the same mechanism going on as you have it in Node.js with the event loop because there's so, some event handler registered, some event loop that executes then this callback when this event occurs. Node.js runs in a single thread that's well-known knowledge, a know cluster module, etc. but the kind of the um, request as such runs in a single thread. And Node.js, in Node.js, all I.O. is asynchronous. This nice saying, like, put it, let's put it different, uh, everything in Node.js is asynchronous except your code, right? You hear that quite often. 
And there is something called LibUV that provides an event loop and a thread pool, and this basically does all of that. So if you're like me, I just, I need always to see some pictures to understand things. I'm a more a visual person. So I try to, yeah, draw a little bit. Um, so how does tr traditional request handling work? Let's talk, it's like PHP or Rails or also Java most of the time. So if the request comes in, every time a request comes in, you create one thread. So one bar here is a thread. A new request comes in, and a new request comes in, and every request, as you see it here, will create, spawn a new thread. Which means also that if one thread is blocked, like doing a very heavy database operation, that's no problem because all other requests are not affected. It becomes a problem if many of those requests are blocked like that because then there are many um, threads hanging around waiting to be executed. So that's the traditional way. The node way is very different because we have some kind of a interwoven request handling here. This means we have one thread and then a request comes in, we process it, but then there is something asynch asynchronous going on. So we load this off and then another request is pr processed. So we do this all in one thread and like switching between requests. So we are handling everything in this one thread. So this goes on and on and on. And there, then there is something like libuv and it's totally magical and no one knows how it works. To, it gets a unicorn here. Um, and that's known knowledge, so that's facts. Um, now we can derive some misconception from that. Everything I say now is wrong. Don't take pictures, please, with me on. Like, um, so we can say the event loop runs in a separate thread to the user code. Makes sense, so we have our main thread, and every time something is to be done, we load it off to our magical event loop, and they this does this whole magic and then pings the main thread back with the callback and lets our uh, main thread um, execute that. Everything that is asynchronous is handled by a thread pool. Yeah, it makes sense. We have a thread pool, so we have to handle asynchronous tasks somehow. So obviously, everything asynchronous means thread pool. And the event loop has to be something like a stack or a queue, right? So if you think of the easiest way to accomplish this whole event loop magic is you have a, a, a queue or a stack and all the tasks you schedule on the event loop are kind of yeah, uh, stacked there and then they are processed one by one and the callback is then executed. Makes to, for, for me at least, this makes totally sense. Um, again, a little bit of a drawing. So we have our main thread here. And here I have this function is asynchronous, it's called cast spell, and I put in some potion, and then here I have a callback, and then I have my event loop. Um, and the event loop already has some spells stacked, so these are requests that are or like tasks that are pending on the event loop. And then we have a thread pool, threads look like aliens uh, for me, and here's a little duck, so it's a pool. And now we send off or load off this, this cast spell to our event loop. And then this gets added to the stack here. Then at some point, all other tasks are done. Now it's our turn. So we send it to the thread pool. The thread pool does some magic there. Then the, then the result comes back. And we can resolve this callback, and we ping the main thread, and on the main thread, the callback runs. Makes totally sense for me, and is totally wrong. Like, really? Um, and the fun thing is that I'm not the only one with that. So there was this very funny and great uh, presentation of Bert Belder at Node Interactive uh, in 2016 in Amsterdam. And he was talking about LibUV because he wrote much of it, so he knows how it works. And if you know, I, I don't know if you know that if we speaker 
prepare for a talk, we always use Google Image Search to find if we have something we can steal there and reuse. And he did this as well, so he was hoping that he finds like good diagrams of how the event loop works, and he used Google Image Search, and everything he found there was actually wrong. So it was really completely plain wrong. So this also, there is some learning in there. Just because it's on Google Image Search, it does not mean that it's yeah, correct in any way. Um, I have a few examples here. Like this one, or that one, or this one, or that one. And interestingly, you see also how everyone kind of copies from the others. It's like always the same, just with different graphics, and like wrong information is repli replicated in a way. Those three are basically the same diagram. And here you see this event queue I was talking about before. And this is equally wrong, so everything there is basically also wrong. Let's talk about the reality, and this is really, I had to find this out the hard way, like our developers that are doing the agent for Node.js, they think C++, they're not JavaScript developers, so they looked into the event loop, they looked into Node.js, looked into how things work, and I was, yeah, totally confident with them and I told them, yeah, I think it's, it works like that, that, and they were always, no, that's wrong. And so they took their time and uh, explained the reality to me. First of all, uh, the event loop does not run in a separate thread than the user code. There is only one thread that executes JavaScript, and the event loop is inherent part of this whole uh, runtime and this whole processing of, of a node application. There is nothing else. Of course, thread pool, we will talk about that. Of course, uh, the V8 engine spawns a few more threads for garbage collection, etc. but when we talk about your code running in Node.js, then it's just this one thread. Everything that's asynchronous is handled by a thread pool. No. LibUV creates a pool with four threads. You can override that by environment variable, but basically it's four threads. And it's only used, and it only uses this thread pool if there is really nothing, no other way to accomplish the task. Because on a modern system, you have a lot of APIs that are already um, asynchronous, like ePOL, or database libraries that are basically, or database backends that are basically already asynchronous. So the event loop is a lot more, or LibUV is a lot more smart than one would think. That it's not stupidly like throw every task at the a thread pool and let it execute. No, it knows, okay, this is a file system operation, okay, this will need the thread pool. This is a database operation, and we can use some system libraries for that. So in any, in, in any case, when it's possible, the thread pool will not be utilized. And I think that's also a very important point here. Um, and event loop is something like a stack or a queue. No, it's a set of phases. And I will show this in a second. Uh, it's a set of phases, and of course, each phase here has some data structures um, that are used in this phase. And these may be stacks or queues, but still, the, the whole process we are running through is phases and not traversing a stack. So now it's my turn to create something you find on Google Image Search then. Um, and I'll show you now the phases, and I will explain each of these phases then in more detail. Uh, first, the first phase is called timers. So we process all timers. The next phase is called callbacks. Then we have a phase dedicated to IO polling. Then one to set the mediate. And then we have close events. And for each of these phases, you see, we have, of course, data structures here. Here we may have some stack of timers we process, or here we have some polling against system events or, or the thread pool. And yeah, there we have stacks again, maybe. But this is traversing phases and not like running through um, a, um, a stack. And 
this all is then kind of tagged, like intact with, with, with ticks. This means the switch between one phase to the another is, is a tick. Let's look at how, or how we can schedule tasks that run in such phases, like timers, for instance. Timers, very easy. Do a set timer or do a set interval, and you schedule something to run in this timers phase. And here I have already, what you see here in red, is actually always callbacks. And that's very interesting because callbacks is basically your code. Um, example, we create, a, we create a HTTP server here and we passed in some request handler function. These request, this request handler function that's uh, executed for every request coming on, it's exactly run in this callbacks phase, which also means that that is basically your code because in Node.js, everything is basically a callback. Think of our express application and you create a route and there you do something in there. Then this route is actually already a callback. And then you have a cascade of callbacks, like you do some database operation in this route, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still a cascade of callbacks. This means everything that's your code is processed here in this callbacks phase. And if you do a set timeout, of course, this is uh, processed within timers, but then also um, this uh, function, this callback function, is then put on this callback stack here and executed then when the callback runs, the next callback stack runs through. Then we have IO polling. You can create that by doing a simple read file. This means here we are polling for system events or for this red pool to see if anything kind of is done now and we, we can proceed or execute the callback means putting again this function on this callback stack here. And then we have set immediate very easy also. Just do a set immediate, this is processed here. And then we have all those close events that are processed with uh, socket on, um, on close. And then you have like, these are all on events like closing a, a socket, etc. Yeah, so that's, basically the phases of the event loop. What you might wonder, because that's also part and you don't see it anywhere here, what about next tick? Next tick is also kind of something we use sometimes, mostly we shouldn't, but we do. Um, next tick basically happens here. So it's like on every, like where you see this, this rectangles, uh, uh, these triangles here, is every time we, Every time one, um, one phase is over to this tick, we will execute everything that is scheduled with next tick. So this runs kind of, yeah, next to the event loop. This is not really part of those phases. And I created a little example here. Can you even read that? It looks not, not really sharp for me. Um, so here what I do, uh, I I schedule something with next tick, then I do some IO polling, this is number one. So I do a read file, then I do another IO polling. This will not utilize this red pool, but will run through system events. Then I do some set immediate, then I do a set timeout. Then I just write something out here on the, on the console, and then I do a next tick again. Uh, maybe in case you wondered why I'm using process standard out write and not console log, this is because console log also can already utilize again a B or can already be asynchronous. So this would kind of destroy this whole thing. So because then it would be another asynchronous operation. And the result you will get then is first we've, this will execute it. So you have this asynchronous callback here because that's already already when you write it into your main like file, index file, and you write something in there, this is already the first asynchronous callback here that ex is executed, and this will be run first. And then you see those next tick, regardless of where we started them, will be executed then and in sequence. So it, this, this means, yeah, they really have priority after that. Then we have timer events, then we have set immediate, and then system polling and thread pool polling makes sense because these are 
always like file system reads, etc. They need a little bit more time, so they uh, run last. I think now we basically know or have an idea how the event loop basically works, right? Hopefully, yes, no? Yeah, I see someone not, so I'm... Um, now when we know that, we should maybe start to find out if we can derive metrics or get, get a metrics from the event loop, because obviously uh, our customers were very, very eager to get that. And just to let me add that, it's interesting because we just learned that no one or that everyone has kind of a misconception about how the event loop really works, but everyone is asking for metrics. So how does this even kind of make sense? Because I have to know actually what I'm measuring here. But who, who knows? Uh, metrics of the event loop, the, the simplest one is tick frequency. And that's a little bit misleading already because as we saw already, and I have, I'm not sure there is some, something ambiguous here because ticks uh, are sometimes meant the, like one step in a phase from one phase to another and sometimes a tick also means this whole run through of the, of the whole event loop and I have to figure out yeah, uh, how to really call that. Um, by now we, ne we call this tick frequency, but if you think about next tick, it's obvious that this is not really what we are measuring here. So what we are measuring here is the number of ticks per time, or tick duration also means how long does a tick take. And this is very easy to do, because you just have to queue some task via set, via set immediate, and this gives you more or less a very clear uh, a very clear point, to a measuring point in your application, and if you time the time between two such set immediates over time, you're very close to measuring how long a run through of the event loop takes. And we were sitting in our sprint planning, and this was something similar like that was shown, just at this time in Excel, and we looked at that and we had also some scenarios and here I re kind of redone this scenarios here. So this is idle, so nothing, no, the application is uh, sleeping basically. Then I use a patch bench, it's a benchmarking tool with a concurrency of five, then with a concurrency of 10. And then I use it and do some requests there via a slow backend to kind of also simulate some congestion here. Um, and what you see here, and that's obvious uh, and, and quite awesome, is that when the event loop is idle, it looks a little bit similar to when it's under heavy load, right? Which makes th these metrics not so yeah, valuable for us. Here you see when there is like this with a concurrency of five, you see, okay, there is, now the event loop is at full speed very slow duration, very high frequency. Here it's, it kind of balances out a little bit, and here suddenly the tick frequency goes down and the dur duration goes up. Not so good. So the problem we see with this metric is idle looks very similar to high load, and we don't really know what we are actually, where the time is really spent. And we were sitting in our sprint planning, we were like, yeah, that's nice metrics, but if I have this now in my application, what do I do with that? So this does not really help. And you might wonder why this is even the case here. So why is idle here, like, means that the event loop frequency is so low? I mean, it makes totally sense from a programming point of view, because uh, we are measuring set immediate here, but the event loop uh, waits in IO polling. Why? Every time you do something in Node.js, it's kind of first triggered by some kind of event, thread event, or incoming request, etc. And if there, if the event loop figures out there is nothing in timers, nothing in callbacks, then it makes sense to spend a little bit more time in I/O polling to see if during this time something something comes in, because obviously there is not more, so it, it waits in I/O polling for a longer time, and this means the event loop is low. It's like really when you're a car and you speed up, it's really when there, there is load, the event loop will also 
start speeding up because it will adapt to the speed. Again, uh, a sign that the event loop is a lot smarter than uh, we may think. Yeah, here you see that. So this is IO polling, what you have here. So we had that and we figured out this is nothing we want to put into the product alone because it does not really tell us much. So we invented something else. Uh, we came up with work processed latency. What is it? We measure how long does an asynchronous task wait to be executed. How can we measure that? We simply schedule a task on a thread pool and wait until it's executed. So this is easy. You can do this when you are a native module where C++, you can schedule work item on the thread pool and basically put yourself here and then you see when you're executed. When it takes long to be executed, makes sense, then yeah, obviously uh, there is a lot more uh, on the thread pool pending and we have to wait longer. Uh, important here is that while we measured the tick duration before here, like this vertical here now, we are now measuring the work process latency uh, horizontally, means that there can be a lot of ticks and still there can be, in this time where there are, I don't know, 1,000 ticks, there can be the I.O. polling can be going on. This means the tick duration is not directly aff affected by this polling here. So they, they are not directly correlated because every time there is nothing going or nothing to process in I.O. polling and we're still waiting because the uh, thread pool is still congested or like busy, then the ticks will just proceed to the next tick, to the next tick, etc. So. So this is really a totally different metric than we had with the tick duration. It's not like that we now measure this polling phase out of this tick duration. Make sense? And if you do that, you already get something that makes sense. Uh, so here I did a B with a concurrency of five. There's not, not much going on. And here I, I'm using Sharp, as Michelle uh, showed before, like image processing, because Sharp utilizes the thread pool. And so I just created a scenario where I just rendered an image again and again in, our, in an express route to find out if I see this on the event loop. And as you see, you indeed see that and you can really derive some insight from that. You can say that a high work process latency uh, means that the thread pool is busy or exhausted. And this is basically a metric that people actually care about because this m means that you're doing something or too much uh, on the thread pool, maybe processing too many images in Node.js, etc. Another metric we came up is the event loop latency. Um, it means how long does a callback wait to be executed? Also, also quite easy to do. We simply schedule something uh, on the timer's queue here, and then we wait until this fires. So this really measures now your callbacks. This measures if you, there is much going on in your code. What does latency mean here? So if you create something like a function view uh, via set timeout, and it sh should run after one second, everything from zero to, to this one second is, actually, is what, what's expected. So we expect it to be processed here. Everything that comes then to the after, so that the delta between that and the real execution is then the latency. Because if we schedule some, something of, to run after one second, and it runs after one second and two millise 200 milliseconds, we have a 200 milliseconds latency because obviously Node.js was too busy or this uh, callback queue was too busy doing something else before our request was really called. So this is quite insightful. And I used, um, in this case, yeah, again, a patch bench, a patch bench and with a concurrent currency of five, and then I calculated Fibonacci uh, in another route to see if I now, I'm now busy on the, on the main thread, like on the, on the callback, on, in the callback um, step, if there is something uh, really um, that, 
or if I see that there is something going on, and as we see, it really worked. So we really see now, okay, there is, yeah, uh, there is something, it's really busy. It's still just 25 milliseconds, but yeah. Inside is a high event loop latency um, means that the event loop is busy processing callbacks. So great, again, we have learned something new. The result of all of that is that in the end, we were able to create this dashboard in our product with all these event loop metrics on one page, and that's totally magic. But the problem is, or what does this really tell you, right? So we did it basically for our customers. We created metrics, but still don't really know what's going on in your application. It's just one pile of metrics more. And how do you even tell if this behavior here is no normal? Who defines what is normal? And this means that every time you collect metrics, also like here, you always have to make sure that you baseline and correlate all metrics you have together and kind of look what's going on in your whole system to really make sense of, 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 of all of that because the metrics alone don't tell you anything. And as I said before, especially with the event loop metrics, so highly in demand, mostly by people that are not even node developers because our customers are more operations folks. They want, want event loop metrics without even knowing how the event loop works and what they're actually measuring. So this was also, was also a, a, a learning for me to really understand what I was doing or which metrics I collect to really make sense of them. But after all, I think this whole journey and also exploring that really yeah, I learned a lot through that because I now know better how everything works together and as a whole understand Node.js a little bit better and I hope I could share that with you in this talk a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, um, very quickly, a commercial break. Uh, now they switched me off. Podemos tener las slides, Por favor. Daniel. Estamos en vivo. Yeah, commercial break. Uh, so what you saw here, uh, what I talked about, this is also on Medium uh, in the Node.js collection. So this is a post that covers basically everything I was talking about in in this talk. Uh, if you like my Austrian accent, you can listen to me on LinkedIn Learning. There is, I have a few courses like how to build a Slack bot. Let me know via Twitter uh, if, in case you want a coupon or so, I can do something, I guess, and cut your license to watch it for free. And now I'm really done. Hasta la vista. Yeah.